This video is supported by Squarespace. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here. We have got some static fire action at Starbase once again, along with some quite intriguing insights into the future of the Starship program. The Starlink network continues to make news as the launch cadence keeps accelerating. Two Starlink launches just this week. The hopefully final countdown is on for Artemis 1. With the initial scrub just days ago, we are biting our nails, awaiting the action to commence potentially just hours from now. I'm diving into what we expect to see during the launch and the first few days of this mission. All that and a lot more, so there is a heap to cover today. Okay, so picking up from last week, we left Ship 24 having been opened up while being supported by the LR11000 crane. Thankfully, a few days later, the hatch was closed up again and the crane was detached, so it was back in action. Nearby, a newly assembled gantry crane geared up to move the can crusher. It was lifted and a self-propelled modular transporter moved it over to the landing pad. The newly arrived B7.1 test tank was then hooked up to the crane and it was lifted up onto that can crusher. Following that, the huge cap was placed on top. Monday arrived and after being notified of a day of activity, the orbital launch mount Raptor work platform was lowered and moved away. The orbital tank farm kicked into action and soon we saw frost starting to form on the liquid oxygen tank. The engine chill events soon started up but sadly there was no action. After a few hours the vehicle was finally depressurized. Later that day we could see a lot of venting from the orbital launch site but no static fire of the booster. Early in the week several more overpressure notices were received by the residents of the area, including of course Boca Chica Gal with NASA spaceflight. Wednesday's first round of testing Booster 7 followed a similar pattern, with the booster being depressurized after about an hour of propellant loading activity. Soon after though, retanking started and this time we did hear that 10 minute siren, followed shortly after by this. Yep. Booster 7 conducted a multiple engine static fire, this time for around 6 to 7 seconds or so. Now this was the third static fire that we've seen for Booster 7. The first was just a single engine static fire on the 9th of August, that was just one of the outer 20 Raptor engines lasting about 3 to 4 seconds. The second static fire was the longest from Starbase, lasting a whopping 20 seconds just days later. Again, this was just one engine. And then this week's test was Booster 7's first ever multiple engine static fire. Nice little milestone there, however it does appear unofficially at least that one of the engines aborted, so it didn't look fully successful. Later in the day the attention was back at Ship 24 testing. Just before 3pm propellant loading started out, but once again just like Booster 7 that morning it was depressurized. On Thursday we got to see some nice B7.1 test tank action. Over multiple hours the valves on the top of the test tank opened and closed several times regulating pressure. If you look very carefully here you can even see the pistons move. Looks like Ship 24 was jealous so it performed some flap testing itself trying to get our attention. The night following this testing the team went back to Booster 7 up there on the work platform. When it was lowered again along with it came a Raptor with engine shrouds included. Wait, hang on a minute, that sure is an unconventional way of lifting it off the platform. Seems like it worked though as a new Raptor was soon lifted up on the platform in a similar fashion. Up it rose into the engine section and just hours later the work platform was gone. It's pretty impressive how quickly SpaceX can switch those engines out now. That wasn't all. Hours later Ship 24 got one of its Raptor vacuum engines removed, number 65 here looking rather rusty there after a lengthy stay at the pad. Now during the week we've had some nice information from Elon tweets. First off is an answer to CSI Starbase. He said here that the orbital launch mount will in the future be used to spin up all 33 Raptor engines rather than just the outer 20. This could lead to a nice weight saving on the booster itself since they will only need to bring enough startup gases for the boost back burn and the landing burn as well. Any startup gases required for the initial ignition for the Center 13 engines will be provided 
provided by the launch mount itself. It is pretty awesome if they can achieve this as well, and I'm personally looking forward to seeing how the booster will need to also evolve. In reply to this tweet showing this awesome infographic, Musk indicated that the Starship and the booster together will most likely be stretched by 5 to 10 metres. Now, this all lines up with tweets from December in 2021, where he mentioned that the ship will also receive a total of six Raptor vacuum engines. I think this, along with the recent announced increase of Raptor 2 engine performance, is the key here. With Raptor 2 at around 230 tonnes of thrust versus the 185 for Raptor 1, this just makes perfect sense. Over at the build site, work continues on future vehicles. Early in the week, Ship 25's nose cone and payload bay section was stacked on top of the forward dome section. This now leaves just one final stack until the vehicle's main structure is complete. Take a look at this shot here showing the nose cone spinning around the turntable. What surprised me here for a second is that SpaceX left the squid lifting jig attached, most likely to streamline the process even more. Now, it is rumoured that Ship 25 may be the last for some time with a heat shield and possibly forward and aft flaps as SpaceX pushes hard to launch Starship version 2 on Starship prototypes as soon as possible. Now, I did talk about Ship 26's nose cone having its tiles removed a few weeks back, leaving only the attachment pins remaining. That nose cone is now completely bare, as seen in this shot here. This to me seemed like the first sign of a potential change of direction. It could be that SpaceX plans to make a disposable ship in the short term and then focus on booster reuse just to get things moving faster. We don't yet know if SpaceX are going to remove the pins from that and the other Ship 26 sections including the common dome here, but if so, that would be another step toward this theory. The middle liquid oxygen section is the only section of Ship 26 that actually remains in the ring yard with the tiles still on it, so it's going to be interesting to see if those tiles are also removed on that as well. So what other evidence do we see to support this idea? Well, many sections have been spotted for future ships that have completely passed by the tile stations. Two examples include Ship 27's middle liquid oxygen section here, which is currently passing through production having already skipped the tile station. That also goes for the aft section which currently resides in the ring yard. The question in my mind is that if SpaceX's goal here is to launch a heap of Starlink version 2s and just dispose of those upper stages for now, how many launches will they be allowed to do from Boca Chica? Remember, the FAA Programmatic Environmental Assessment shows only five super heavy launches per year. Now, that is an initial proposed number that could potentially change, but unless it does so dramatically, it is kind of hard to see how SpaceX plans to deliver the thousands of satellites from Texas. This is why the infrastructure at Florida is so critical, so let's head over now to see the progress made over there. On Sunday, the LR11350 crane was lowered down in preparation to be extended further for the last two tower segments. A few days later, more of the inner sections of the mysterious tank was added inside. The eighth section of the tower was moved to the launch site on Wednesday as shown here by Spaceflight Now. You can see here how this segment has got some temporary metal bracing to support the segments during the lift, and beams were welded onto the segment so that scaffolding for the crew can be placed here. On the previous segments, these beams weren't needed as the scaffolding could rest on the horizontal beams. During the week, we also got to see an awesome aerial view of historic Launch Complex 39A. In this one, you can actually see the crane lowered to the ground with the team extending it. It is pretty darn cool to see that from freaking space, isn't it? Down at the base of the Starship Tower, we can see all of the ground surface equipment pipes coming out of the tower base. That is a site that we are going to soon lose because it will all be buried under the ground. Right next to that, the mysterious double wall tank with more sections nearby and a dome as well. To the side here, what looks to be a tank farm setup quite similar to Starbase. We can spot four pads on the ground for what could be the cryo pumps. Next to these could be the stands related to the propellant super chilling, and then two horizontal cryogenic storage tanks with room for many more. 
So yes, a reasonably eventful week for Starship News, but of course with most people down at the Cape for the Artemis 1 mission, the coverage continued thanks to the relentless 24-7 camera feeds from both the incredible NASA Spaceflight and Lab Padre. The support for these channels is just so critical, so thanks for supporting what they do, and of course for clicking all these things around the place to support what I do here with the team as well. Getting real close to that goal of 450,000 subscribers by the end of the year, that sort of blows my mind to be honest. So yes, it certainly comes down to Artemis 1's flight, doesn't it? It was certainly an interesting start to the week for the much-anticipated NASA SLS and Orion test flight. The build-up to the day was huge, with expectations set early on by NASA in their public engagements on just how this launch was going to pan out. I'll jump into that along with a rundown of the stages for launch in just a moment, but first, a huge thank you to Squarespace today for supporting this video. Squarespace is a great all-in-one one platform that you can use to get online quickly and without needing to know a bunch of programming or web development skills. Even as a total beginner, you will immediately feel right at home. You could start your passion project that maybe you've been putting off. Maybe you would like to set up a personal website as a CV, perhaps a blog to share your experiences, amazing photography, art or craft work. Squarespace is there to guide you all the way and their support channel here provides a huge library of useful tips. Take this this recent video here about using blocks to add video and other elements to a page on your site. You can upload a video directly or just add a video hosted by YouTube or Vimeo as one quick example. Once you've added your content, you can upload a preview image as an overlay to entice your users to click. Simply add a video caption, a description, and there you have it. If you want to check it out for yourself, just head to squarespace.com slash Marcus House and save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. You'll find that link in the description below. So yes, the recent wet dress rehearsal for Artemis 1 was unable to test some aspects of the series of complex sequences required for the actual mission. Sadly, due to a leak with the quick disconnect, one such untested process was the hydrogen kickstart or engine bleed system. This step on launch day saw liquid hydrogen and oxygen flow through the amazing RS-25 engines to chill them down. This reduces thermal shock on the components before the final countdown. At the time, NASA believed that one of the four engines did not quite reach the optimal thermal conditioning temperature that they were after. With a bunch of engineers on site, many of them worked the problem during an unplanned countdown hold. They attempted to increase the flow rate to the troublesome engine number three by shutting down the flow to the other three core stage engines. That didn't seem to help. More recently, it appears that the issue was more related to a faulty sensor instead of a problem with that engine. So with all of this trouble combined, with bad weather meant that the conditions just weren't right to continue. The launch was then scrubbed, with all of us impatiently waiting to see the announcement on what would come next. A huge amount of work in the following days continued as focus shifted to the next launch window on Saturday afternoon, the 3rd of September. Yep, that launch could be coming just hours after this video goes live, so more than likely we know the outcome of this already. Now, I've got my fingers crossed there as I click render on this video. Interestingly, this launch time was not previously mentioned as a launch opportunity, so I could speculate here on what might might happen during today's attempt, but I think it is best demonstrated by the fantastic work here by infographic extraordinaire Tony Bella. His latest Artemis 1 infographic is just full of insightful detail of the launch event to come, which you can pick up in full quality from the description if you would like a copy. Firstly, the launch, firing the colossal dual solid rocket boosters and four RS-25s by Aerojet Rocketdyne. This will be the most powerful rocket to ever lift off from the United States, but Really, that is due to the power of those SRBs. Saying all this, they only last a little less than two and a quarter minutes before the four RS-25s take on the rest of the job. We are already moving at over 5,000 kilometers per hour. At that point, the SRBs are jettisoned and the thrust to weight ratio is drastically minimized with the core stage continuing on alone. A minute later, the service module fairing jettison, followed 15 seconds or so later by the launch abort system rocketing off out of the way. That continues to reduce the mass of the vehicle to increase efficiency just that little bit more. 
The acceleration grows as the massive core stage empties out, and at 8 minutes and 20 seconds engine shutdown, the core stage is depleted, separated, and the upper interim cryogenic propulsion stage fires briefly, placing Orion into a parking orbit around the Earth. Orion is now in orbit, awaiting the massive translunar injection burn. This engine is slow and efficient, and it takes about 20 minutes and accelerates just a little under 2,750 meters per second. Yeah, it takes a lot of energy to get to the moon. It will then pass through the Van Allen radiation belt and head off to intercept that glorious globe in the sky. At that point, the ICPS stage is almost done. It is separated, but it will still serve as a platform to launch some CubeSats along the way, looping around the moon, and finally ending up in an orbit around the sun. Orion, of course, is left to complete the mission, and it's going to pass close to the moon doing a powered flyby, and it will place itself eventually into a distant retrograde orbit. Assuming NASA sticks with the longer duration plan, because there is also a short duration option, it would be up here in orbit for about 30 days, but time is going to tell on that. Regardless, I'll of course be keeping you all up to date on how it is all going. I just cannot wait for this. Should today's launch attempt not proceed, the earliest next available opportunity I think should be September 5th, assuming of course that nothing has changed already. So yes, best of luck there to the entire Artemis team. We also had two Starlink missions this week, among a bunch of other news around the network. Every time I talk about a Starlink launch, there seems to be even more added stories to cover with it. The network has just evolved so quickly this year. First, the launches though. Right after my video last Saturday, SpaceX launched 54 Starlink satellites from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral. This was the second flight for the Falcon 9 first stage booster, 1069. The only glimpse of the satellite stack right here at Fairing Department deploy, and yet another successful touchdown on a shortfall of Gravitas just before midnight. Now, this mission in fact, as stated by Jesse here in the stream, was the highest ever payload mass to orbit on a recoverable Falcon 9, 16.7 metric tons in total. Musk just afterwards said that SpaceX are able to squeeze extra performance out of the vehicle, and that of course includes the reused booster and fairing. Not one other company that can currently compete with such metrics, and as he stated midweek, SpaceX are aiming for around 100 flights in 2023. That is just mind-boggling. In fact, SpaceX have also been awarded another five Crew Dragon missions, so Crew 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14 flights will be with SpaceX at a fixed value just a little over $1.4 billion. So what the long-term plan may be for Starliner is becoming a little more grey. The second launch of the week was on Tuesday evening, this time way over at Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. The first stage, Booster 1063 on its seventh flight for this one, shot up another 46 satellites. Now, the reason that these missions from Vandenberg take less is because near polar orbits take a little more energy to get into. We don't get the benefit of Earth's rotation so much for those ones, and that means eight less satellites. So yeah, it makes quite a difference, doesn't it? This mission landed on the drone ship, of course I still love you, and that wrapped up the second mission of the week. Now, the Royal Caribbean Group tweeted out the exciting announcement that they are going to use Starlink in an industry first to provide high-speed internet on board their full cruise fleet. In fact, the hardware is already being installed, I believe, so this should be close as it is. It's also worth noting that the legal battle between Starlink and DISH with Viasat is now over, with Starlink and SpaceX coming out the victor. Now, I'd say there's quite a lot of adjustments going on as the network evolves to meet all of this demand, as a global outage was reported early in the week, and I don't recall seeing that before. Interestingly, some have been contacted recently as well with offers of discounted rates, which I assume is a plan to draw in users from low adoption areas. After all, SpaceX are best to keep capacity in all areas active rather than empty, so until there is more demand from those areas, there are some good deals to be had. Starlink is changing the world very rapidly as SpaceX invests big in capturing this untapped market. It really is an incredible story when you break it all down. 
My favourite little space plane, the Dream Chaser by Sierra Space, is making massive progress. Just check this out. Yep, I know what you're thinking. It looks like they've gone backwards from the Dream Chaser tenacity here. Well, that is because this is a different Dream Chaser name yet to be determined. Although, out of all of the suggested names that you came up with in my thread right there, yep, I think this one nails it nicely. So, yes, that is very cool, isn't it? Along with tenacity, development seems to be really ramping up now. In in fact, just over the past few weeks, the Orbital Reef team led by Sierra Space and Blue Origin has successfully completed a system definition review with NASA. That was a super important program milestone too for the Orbital Reef concept, which is a proposed space station to be constructed in low Earth orbit. This essentially means that the idea has been evaluated as a feasible concept as they collectively continue proceeding into the design phase. The whole idea is to have a fleet of Dream Chaser vehicles taking commercial passengers up into orbit to experience life at one of these futuristic space stations. So yes, loads of stuff there and hopefully that Artemis 1 predicted action is going to age well. Thank you all for watching and supporting what we do here. If you are picking up some merch from our store like this one here, that helps a great deal. I'm quite fond of that fully stacked one and there are other designs that you might be interested in right here if you scroll through. If you like what I do here with the team on the channel and you'd like to help assist directly with what we do, the best way is via patreon.com slash Marcus House or as a YouTube member. With that, we can chat directly on Discord, you can have your name listed right here, and you also get ad-free copies of these videos as well. If you want even more frequent updates, follow me on Twitter at Marcus House. I've had so many people loving the deep dive video that we put out talking about nuclear, ion, and future propulsion if you missed it last week. It is right there along with some other deep dives as well. Thank you everyone for watching all this way through. I'll see you all in the next video.